very pleased on behalf of the Kirk Session to make the following intimation. The Kirk Session met recently to discuss how and when it might be possible and appropriate for us to resume gathering for worship within the church building. The overriding objective is of course to ensure as far as possible the safety and well-being of those attending church and taking part in the services. Having discussed the matter extensively, it was the unanimous view of the Kirk Session, which we believe is shared by the majority of our members, that it would not be appropriate to open at present, that is, during Phase 3 of the Scottish Government's route map for recovery. The limited nature of what we would be permitted to do during Phase 3 would, we feel, be so far removed from what we are all used to, that it has been decided to aim for a return at some appropriate point following the introduction of Phase 4 in due course. To this end, work is progressing on an eventual safe return to our much-loved building, and we will, of course, keep you fully up to date as things develop. In the meantime, the Kirk Session is delighted that so many of you from Butte and much further afield are enjoying our weekly online services and we are most grateful for the many messages of support and encouragement which have been received. Thank you and stay safe. Hello there and welcome to worship. A well-known American professor of practical theology once told his graduating class of soon-to-be ministers, don't forget People who don't like you might like Jesus. The challenge to the church, not just people whose company tie looks like this, is to understand that there are times when we can get between Jesus and people who would like him, people whom God loves. There's a whole class of jokes which we in our primness might think are disrespectful, but actually they display an unchurchy affection for and admiration of Jesus of Nazareth. A lot of these are about the gospel story for today. Jesus walking on water in swimming pools, on golf course water hazards, even the baby Jesus standing on top of his bath water. They seem to express a lot of things. Admiration, disbelief, a sense of specialness, a sense of mystification, a perception that this story expresses something more than just specialness, a special connection with God. A complete puzzlement as to what to make of that. Very often we don't help that perplexity and puzzlement. We come over as insisting that this story is a test of faith. You can't simply accept it, you don't believe, and you can't belong. It's hard to imagine a way of thinking further from that of Jesus. But then, as I say, very often the people who get between Jesus and the people who are drawn to him are the people who think that Jesus belongs to them. The basic question is always, what does this mean? The story of Jesus walking on the water is astonishingly rich in real human meaning. The meaning our lives have before God and in God. The people who are drawn to it but can make no sense of it are onto something. There is something incredibly important here. Welcome to worship.
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You are nearer than ever we imagined. Distance from each other, we have not been distanced from you. Deprived of the touch of others, handshake, hug and consoling embrace, we have known the touch of your grace and presence and the embrace of your love even in all of this. We have learned so much that is new about the presence of God with us. Your presence, Lord, in which we have always lived. Your presence which we see and understand more richly now. We do not see you with our eyes, yet you can open the eyes of our souls and see your presence everywhere, in ways we had not suspected. In places and at times we would never have imagined, we find that you are there. You are the God who comes to us, so that we may come to you. And yet we have not come, for we have ignored your presence, forgotten your ways, lived as though we did not live in you. We confess these things in sorrow. We ask your forgiveness. And you do forgive in Jesus Christ, for you come to us anew in grace and forgiveness. You abolish the distance between us and you and overcome our estrangement in him. You are with us, even when we cannot see it and do not know it. Awake us to your presence. Open our eyes. Amen. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. That's where Elijah had found himself. A society and therefore a world that had fallen apart. But fallen apart advantageously for some. Jezebel especially. She had ambitions for her weak husband. Are you not king in Israel? She had whispered in his ear to steal him to do murder. And when he balked and bottled out, she did it herself, in his name. Who could stop her? Things had fallen apart. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Loosed because its time had come, and things go in cycles, don't they? Well, perhaps. But there were those who had connived at this unloosing of anarchy because it suited them. They always are. And with anarchy, the blood-dimmed tide is loosed. Restraint is gone, inhibition is gone, life is cheap when people assert themselves and diminish their fellows. That's where Elijah found himself. Either no life is meaningless, or all lives are meaningless. If we cannot point to a threatened life, single out a threatened group and say, this life is important, these lives matter, we cannot truthfully say that any 
or all lives are important. Elijah's life had become unimportant. The Queen had a contract out on the Prophet, but to compound his horror, she sent a messenger who said, After me comes the assassin. Small wonder his nerve broke. Small wonder he fled. Who would even miss him? Who would stand up for him? Who stood up for anything anymore? The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. The hard, callous, steely-eyed times themselves stared down on him in that wilderness. A gaze blank and pitiless as the sun. Where could he find sanctuary? Or even shade in that barren place swept by shadows of the indignant desert birds? Yet he had been fed by the ravens of the desert before. Even here in the wilderness, God sent sustenance was to be found to allow the journey to continue. And so he came to Horeb, Mount of God. How stupid the obvious question must have sounded. What are you doing here, Elijah? But what a good and healing question that was. Out it all tumbled in a rush. I have been very zealous. They have forsaken, thrown down, killed. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Yes, Elijah, that's how things really are. And now you're wondering where God is in all of this. You expected him in awesome special effects, big screen cinematic interventions, earthquake, wind and fire. Seek him in the still, small voice, the sound of nothing at all, and you will discover that he's never not been there, all's the same. But now everything is different. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Elijah comes to a mountain cave. His world has collapsed. Sense, meaning, structure have gone. They're blotted out by a chaos that is bigger than everything else. A monstrous evil that fills the world. Nothing is bigger than it. This is an extreme experience under extreme circumstances. But it's a version of an experience we all fear. And many, maybe all of us, have experienced something like it. Something huge and terrifying fills our world. And blots everything else out. An illness. A loss. A trauma. 
Nothing is bigger than this. Nothing is bigger than what's happening to me now. I am entirely in its power. I can see nothing else. Where is meaning? Where is God? That's where Elijah finds himself. As he shelters in a cave on the slopes of Mount Horeb. Why are you here, Elijah? It's all too big. It's the biggest thing in my universe. I can't cope. I'm overwhelmed. I'm crushed. And he's invited out of his cave onto the mountain. And power, might, the spectacular and impressive march by. Earthquake, wind and fire. And God isn't in any of them. Why would he be? Are these things bigger than God? Can we use comparisons? Earthquake, fire, wind, to convey that God is God. Seek God in an earthquake. What if a bigger earthquake comes along? Imagine that the hurricane expresses the power of God. What if the next hurricane dwarfs it? Imagine something big, huge, and you can always imagine something bigger. Imagine God that way, and you will always be able to imagine a bigger God. And it won't be God you're imagining. God isn't in the earthquake, wind and fire. And then the special effects fade. It all falls quiet. And in the quietness, a barely audible sound. Or is it even as one translation has it, the sound of nothing at all. But it changes everything. The silent presence there all along. Tiny, barely noticeable, and bigger than anything. Bigger than everything. Then Elijah is asked the same question. Why are you here? The same answer, word for word. But it's not a tumbling cascade or waterfall of words. It's a measured, calm statement of how things actually are. It's a summing up of reality in all its difficulties. Right, is told. Now... Go back and face it. And he does. Because now he can. Somehow in what just happened, he found the presence of God. And the presence of God in this difficult, dangerous reality changes everything. Everything is the same, but everything is different. As we said last week, that's what God does.
our bodies are 60% water. The sea is a huge reality in our human existence. Life emerged from the sea. And thinkers like the Hungarian psychoanalyst Sandor Ferenczi have helped us understand the connection between the sea and the pre-birth experience of being in the womb. The people brought up at the seaside, like me, the horizon is the boundary of the world, but a boundary with a beyond to it that you just can't see. The sea represents the limits of seeing and knowing, but not of everything that is to be known. It seems to stand for the scale and power of a universe which makes us, human beings, insignificant to the point of vanishing smallness. Canute demolished the flattery of his courtiers who said that his greatness was such that he could command the tide not to roll in by taking them to the shore and having the sea ignore him and roll straight over the feet of his throne. And the sea, and especially the Somi Sea, is power and might and destruction and yes, death. Before we come to today's gospel reading, let's set the proper scale. When I woke, the waves had gone black, turning over the macerated curd of the ocean bottom, heaving its sludge onto the beach. Some storm far out, I thought, had ravaged the sea, stirred up its bed, sent the whole mess flying to shore. At my feet I found a grave of starfish, broken and gnarled among the fleshy snipes and heads. Every shade of death covered the sand. It looked hopeless in the pale day, but for the birds, a congress of gulls, terns, and the rarest plovers, calm for once, satiated, a measure of the one law. This sea will claim it all, feed them, catch them, grind their complicated bones. The Jewish people, unlike their Phoenician cousins, were terrified of the sea. It seemed to represent to them an area of existence that called the power of God into question. Israel was very iffy about the sea. Yet even here, her experiences of timidly pushing the boundaries of human experience of God and finding that God is still there and still God. Go back to what we said about the meaning of the sea for us, just as human beings. Boundary, limit overwhelming, unimaginable, dwarfing power, life and death. Imagine an industrial strength distillation of that in the Jewish mind of the psalmist, of the disciples. And don't forget that Jesus was a Jew. Then listen to this profoundly Jewish, profoundly and sheerly human reflection on the sea. If you like numbers, it's Psalm 107 verses 23 to 30. Keep it in mind as we come to the Gospel reading straight after it. Psalm 107 Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths, their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. Reading from the Gospel according to St Matthew, chapter 14, reading from verse 22 to verse 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, 
it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking in the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Amen. This is a story about faith. The church's faith and your faith, our faith, my faith. A wee crew in an increasingly storm-battered little craft, rapidly coming to the limit of their capacity to cope. They are completely enfolded in the terror of the wild, uncontrollable sea. There is nothing bigger than that storm in the whole of their universe. There is nothing else. And then, the terrifying power of the waves is itself enfolded in something even more frightening, commanding, overawing. Something bigger than the storm, something bigger than the sea, something than which, in the ancient formulation, nothing greater can be conceived. God. And the experience of these disciples on this foundering boat can be our experience too. When life is framed by the constraints of human existence, sometimes threatening and traumatic. A child is born. I recently became a great uncle. And our lives are framed by joy. It fills our horizons. We lose somebody we love. And our lives are reframed, redefined by grief. For now, there is nothing else. The circumstances of our living change, as ours are all going to change in the aftermath of this pandemic. Jobs are lost, incomes put under threat, our attitudes to other people are altered by months of having to distance from them while we're among them. And our lives are framed now by uncertainty, anxiety, apprehension. I look into the mirror, and that measures the distance between the X, which is my present age, 63 in my case, and the 27, which I still am, in my own head. And that frames my human existence, my finitude, my mortality. Just as the unopposable power of the storm frames the existence of the disciples in this boat. You too. We are hemmed in by these things as by a storm at sea. And then, in the heart of the storm, something happens. We experience something which dwarfs all of these things, which frames them, tames them, and puts them in context. We experience God. In the terrifying, world-consuming storm that was the Third Reich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, theologian and martyr, in faith, faced down everything that was happening. And he came to pay the price. He was hanged by the Nazis at the Flossenburg concentration camp on the 9th of April 1945 with the Americans only six miles away. The last recorded words he spoke were, this is death, for me, the beginning of life. The God who is bigger than the storm is the God who is bigger than death. Even death is framed and put in new context by the life we are invited to step into now, in our Discipleship of Jesus.
What does Peter experience? It's something we could easily miss, but he doesn't just jump into the water. Did you notice that odd little request? Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Peter is asking to do this at Jesus' own command. In other words, not in his, Peter's own strength, in faith. We often hear and tell this story as though Peter gets distracted like a high wire walker who stops looking straight ahead and wobbles dangerously or worse. He should have looked at Jesus, it was his own fault. And we think that's the meaning of the story, summed up in the words, oh you of little faith. Well, maybe that's what Matthew thought the story meant. It's interesting that the expression, oh you of little faith, occurs four times in the New Testament and they're all in Matthew. But the story that he receives from the spoken gospel tradition is bigger than that. Peter isn't distracted. He's overwhelmed. He can see nothing but his own danger framed by the angry sea and the furious storm. And the bigger frame offered by the commanding and earthly figure walking on the waves suddenly evaporates. We all know that experience. We all know what it's like to be overwhelmed, to have everything put into doubt, to wonder if we ever knew anything at all that was true or dependable or capable of being trusted or of supporting us. And if we think that faith is certainty in these things, which we as human beings never have, then we imagine that the loss of certainty, the presence of uncertainty and deep distressing doubt is loss of faith. And in this story, it's not. Faith was when Peter stepped out of the boat in the first place. And faith was when Peter, sinking and overwhelmed, cried out, Lord, save me. The certainty is gone, but not the trust. And yes, Jesus, grasping him, says to him, Oh, you of little faith. Not, no faith, notice. Jesus, grasping him, notice. We are all of little faith in this sense. And it doesn't get between us and God. God won't let it. We think that faith is to do with our hold on God, our grasp on God, our certainty, our conviction. So when we're overwhelmed, when we lose sight of things, when nothing seems to make sense and it feels as though God has disappeared, we imagine that faith has disappeared as well. It hasn't. Faith isn't our grasp of God. Our grasp of God comes and goes and is sometimes barely discernible. Our world sometimes is terrifying and we are overwhelmed. Faith isn't our grasp of God. Faith is God's grasp of us and our response to that, which at times like those isn't going to be a saintly serenity and an unearthly conviction, but a desperate, where are you? There are times when I can't draw on my frail grasp of God. Faith is trusting where I can't see God's mighty grasp of me. It was that trust in this story that got Peter to step out of the boat in the first place. That's what our next hymn is all about and exactly how John Campbell Shep puts it.
Let us pray. God of light, God of love, God of compassion beyond imagining. We know that this world does not yet reflect your abundant love for it. We know that even as many of us feast and rejoice, there are many of your children who know only suffering, fear, hunger or horror. We know that we so often fail to notice the needs and desires of these, your beloved ones, preferring instead to remain in our comfortable cocoons, enjoying what you have given, hoarding the riches of creation. Come amongst us again, transforming God, and inspire us to work for change for the coming of your kingdom here on earth. Come amongst us again, transforming God, and show us the new thing that you are doing in this, your beautiful, broken world. Lord of all, we pray for all those who are searching for peace in their lives, those burdened with anxiety, either about themselves or their loved ones, facing difficulties and problems to which they can see no solutions. God of peace, reach out and still the storm. We pray for those wrestling with inner fears and phobias, torn apart by emotional and psychological pressures. God of peace, reach out and still the storm. We pray for those living amongst change and upheaval, especially all who are threatened by violence and warfare. God of peace, reach out and still the storm. To all those in chaos and turmoil, all who are restless and troubled, grant your calm, your tranquility, your quietness and your peace, which passes understanding. God of peace, reach out and still the storm. Lord, we continue to pray for all those for whom the pandemic has been a struggle. We remember the scientists working tirelessly to identify a safe vaccine. We pray that you will strengthen their hand so that they can continue their vital work on our behalf. As we begin to see some progress in our day-to-day -day living, we pray for those who are still feeling afraid about the virus and who are missing out on the everyday things they would normally be doing at this time of year. Be with them, Lord, and reassure them of your protection during these difficult times. We pray too for all those who are responsible for our steady and safe progress towards some degree of normality, especially those charged with planning for the reopening of churches so that we may worship together again. Guide those making these decisions to do so carefully and thoughtfully, so that we avoid wrecking our progress to date. Lord, we pray today for your church and for this church and its people in particular. We bring to you those who are struggling, those struggling with a health issue, fearful of what the future holds for them, those struggling with loneliness, wondering who their next visitor will be, those struggling with money issues, wondering how to pay the next bill, and those struggling with the worry of a family member, someone who needs constant care, or someone making poor life choices those struggling with their own conscience over an issue that is personal to them and to you. Lord, you know the struggles that we all face, the issues that concern us most, but you also tell us to hand these struggles over to you, that you will lift that burden from us. And so we do that now, in the next few moments of quiet, contemplative prayer. Lord, where there is hatred and division, may there be reconciliation. 
Where there is hunger and want, may there be satisfaction. Where there is fear and uncertainty, may there be comfort. Where there is sorrow and anger, may there be joy. Where hearts are hard, where people are selfish, where injustice reigns, where it seems that there is no hope left, sweep through us with your power, with your compassion and with your promise, until all are fed, all live in harmony, all know our incredible worth as your children. God, you have promised your special blessing on those who mourn, your comfort to those overwhelmed by grief, your joy to those enduring sorrow. May all those who mourn discover the comfort you have promised and find strength to face tomorrow until that time comes when light shall dawn again and hope be born anew. Hear these our prayers in Jesus' name. Hear now our prayer as we say the prayer that you taught us. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the, the kingdom, kingdom and the power and, and the glory forever and Amen. ever. Amen. Reality, joyous and marvellous, perplexing and challenging, by turns profound and shallow, gloomy and glorious, full of possibility, frustrating and restrictive, routine and astounding, and at times saddening and frightening. Reality. We cannot and need not describe our world to God or to ourselves or to each other. We know it. We live there. It is where we meet God. It is where God finds us. Go out into this real, real world. For you go in the spirit and Christ goes with you to bring you through all things to God. Blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen.
Thank you.